Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second session in our security webinar series, Reduce Risk with Risk, Designing and Maintaining Secure Embedded Linux Devices with Advantech Risk Platforms. I'm Teresa Kisha, and I'm your host again today for uh, today's session. With me today is Maciej Halas, Vice President of Technology at TimeSys. Maciej heads up the EMEA office and will be the instructor for today's session. Also on board with us today is Jason Zhu, Risk Product Manager at Advantech. And we have Akshay Bhatt, uh, Security Architect, Senior Engineer at TimeSys. Today's session will focus on verifying the authenticity of software running on your device. Before we begin, I'd like to take a minute to, to mention a few things. This session will be recorded and the recording will be available post event. The link to the recording along with a link to today's slides will be emailed to everyone within the next business day. In order to keep things moving and within the time we've allotted, all attendees will be on mute during the presentation. Following the session, we will have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A to answer any questions that you may have. To ask a question, simply post it via the questions window panel and Mache, Jason, or Akshay will answer it during the Q&A. And finally, after today's session, as was the case last week, one lucky attendee will receive an Advantech RSB 4411 SBC compliments of Advantech. Everyone in attendance today will be automatically entered uh, into the giveaway for this, for this drawing. The winner from today's session will be notified via email. So good luck, everyone. And now, without any further delay, I'll go ahead and hand over the controls to Mache to get things started. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's session. Thank you very much, Teresa, and uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, I wanted to start today's session by doing a short recap from uh, the conversation we had two weeks ago. And uh, back then, uh, we talked about, uh, we started the discussion on security by introducing the Stay Secure solution from TimeSys, which uh, helps solve the ongoing security challenge uh, for your product. Um, it allows you to track the CVs applicable to your product, and um, the solution also autom automatically applies uh, relevant patches. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> this um, Security notification and security patching services are available uh, for both uh, Yocto and um, factory build systems. We have uh, focused of, um, last session uh, around Yocto, and I showed you a couple of uh, uh, videos um, and live sessions uh, from how the notification and security patching works. Um, the great thing about the solution offered by TimeSys in this area is that very little effort and knowledge is needed um, prior to start using this solution. Um, and it can be very easily applied to um, your product, to your own Yocto um, BSPs, Yocto uh, distributions. Uh, we have recorded a video uh, which is posted on YouTube. Um, the direct link is in the slides that uh, are accessible to you as well. And um, one thing that we also talked about last time is that uh, with a uh, one of the three boards that are listed in this slide, uh, the DS31, 6410, and 4411, all of which are risk products from Advantech, um, you get a complimentary 90-day subscription uh, to TimeSys Security Vulnerability Notification Service um, free. Okay, so. Um, that's uh, that's recap from session one. Um, <clears throat> and as Teresa said, uh, there was a giveaway and that um, the price that we draw for session one for session two, we also have a price. So uh, uh, good luck to everyone. Uh, today we're going to start our conversation by introducing a bit more the IMX6 processor. Um, my colleague from Advantech, Jason Zhu, is going to uh, take us through uh, this topic. And then we're going to um, discuss the uh, secure boot topic, uh, followed by chain of trust, 
some of the topics which are a little bit cryptic, but I promise that at the end of today's session, um, all of these uh, subjects uh, in the agenda, all of these topics will be um, um, much clearer to everyone. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about um, verification in the root file system, and we're going to finish uh, today's presentation by discussing some additional methods of software verification on a device. So that's the agenda for today. Let's jump to um, the first topic, um, IMX6 processor, and I'm going to pass the control over to my colleague at Advantech, um, Jason. So uh, switching and should should work now. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to join the webinar today. This Jason Zhu from Advantech Risk Product Manager. Today, I'm going to talk about accelerating and secure your ARM project development for Advantech Risk Platform. First, why we choose NextB Item X6 Platform? The market for intelligent multimedia centric touch based devices is increasing rapidly for the past couple of years. Tomorrow's battery powered smart devices. Auto infotainment, in flight entertainment system, medical system, personal and enterprise class intelligent controls, and data systems. The new classes of devices never be before seen need to represent data and user interface choice to the end user, primarily through rich sound, video, voice, picture, and touch, rather than the keyboards and the mouse before. So the need for manufacturer to quickly provide multiple devices to fit specific market segments or niches and provide their customer with a broader range of choice is increasing just as quickly. The Itemix series of the application is a feature and a performance scalable multiple platform by including single door quad core families based on ARM core. Cortex architecture. The Item X6 series were designed specifically to enable the new market by bringing together high performance cable multimedia processing, a software compatibility family of solutions with integrated power management so that the manufacturer like we do can deploy all four portfolio of product with a single hardware design. On hardware side, Advantech offer various risk solutions, including risk modules, single board computers, we call SBC, and box computers based on the ARM processor technologies. Our risk modules can fulfill different market demands, standard Q7 risk module, smart module for handheld devices, and industrial applications. The RTX 2.0, which is Advantech preparatory, form factor special design for ruggedized application. In RISC SBC offering, we optimize our boards with simplified I.O. for vertical market, like RSP board for signage, digital signage, and industrial controls. For risk box solutions, we design plug and play risk box for a specific use as signage and IoT. That brings a new vision of the future that risk board devices uh, all over everywhere. Advantech risk products are released along with a standard evaluation kit to evaluate performance and state abilities. The evaluation kit is also a software development platform for developing applications in early stage. It includes the complete image, test programs, utilities, and an SOP so customers can verify software, hardware, capability very easy. We also offer a complete software package including a BSP, overloader, middleware, and a corresponding documents like the development guide, API illustration, and the driving driver list. Customers can get all information and source code they need from Admantech and all standard offering are free of charges. Furthermore, we are cooperation with Tamsys. Uh, so we are capable of doing BSP customization, driver reporting, software integration, firmware updates, even a secure boost, faster boost, 
So we are capable of doing anything of them by corroborating which time system. In the next couple of slides, time system will address how important the security is, especially during your development stage. Now also the topic for security boot, chain of trust, kernel verification, and so on. So thank you, and back to you guys. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just switch back to my slides. And um, thank you very much, Jason. Um, let's uh, continue on a topic of uh, security. And I'm going to start uh, the topic um, of securing a device today by um, discussing briefly uh, different attack angles. Um, so let's say that we have a device, um, Linux-based device, uh, using an Advantix system, and there is a display. Uh, when we look at the uh, software that's running on this device, from the Linux perspective, there is a bootloader, there's Linux kernel, and there's file system. File system can have uh, different logic, um, libraries, uh, applications. And um, when we look at a device like that, um, we can look at it from a perspective of um, how can one get access to uh, what the uh, device does. Um, so there's direct connection to the system. If there are any expansion ports, uh, USB, CAN, or any other ports that are on a device, that's definitely one attack vector. Uh, another can be um, storage. If a system has uh, an SD card, um, it's uh, something that a, an attacker can swap, same for hard drives. Um, perhaps uh, access, direct access to memory can be compromised. Network access, of course, if there is no security on the network, um, that's one of the uh, most common access points for an attack um, from the outside. And then um, other usual suspect, if there is a console open on the serial port, that's definitely a, an attack factor that would simplify someone stealing the device or data that it uh, um, controls. And then uh, bootloader settings access. If someone can um, redirect uh, what device is booting, uh, potentially they could um, have their own software running on a device and hijack the data that is collected. So this is just the tip of an iceberg, but gives an idea as to um, different attack vectors that um, can be identified on any device. Last time I, I introduced this slide to everyone <clears throat> and um, there are two main sections. There is a secure by design and stay secure. During session one, we talked or focused uh, primarily on staying secure. Uh, we talked about threat identification and how to mitigate that threat. Today, we're going to uh, focus on the um, secure by design and specific aspect of it, which is the secure boot. Okay. There are other aspects of secure by design which are going to be discussed in a follow-on session, so uh, please do come back uh, to, uh, to those other um, sessions, to those other discussions. When we talk about um, device security, it's not only secure boot that we um, uh, have to worry about, right? It's, uh, and I'm going to uh, describe in more details what secure boot is um, today. Uh, so uh, secure boot uh, allows us to um, verify that the software that runs on a device comes from us. So that's the short um, description or short definition of what secure boot allows us to accomplish. Uh, but on top of that, uh, we have other security measures that um, we have to implement to secure storage, for example. Um, encryption may be a good aspect that um, uh, you should perhaps also consider for the product. Uh, that's a um, topic that's going to be dis uh, discussed during session three. <clears throat> Identity management is another area. If we allow multiple users to um, operate applications and a system, um, good um, identity, identity identification and management is a key. And then secure data communication and uh, 
secure network access are two other areas that uh, we have to be aware of uh, if we're building a secure device there are different design aspects that we have to consider and lastly um, policies and certifications so all of these uh, will allow us to um, design and implement certain security measure that um, may have different goals. Um, one goal can be to verify that the software that's running on a device always comes from us. Another one may be um, uh, to uh, protect the software from being analyzed, right? So there are different levels of security that we can implement. And uh, security is always this elusive target. We have to stay on top of it. Um, and uh, staying secure service that we've described last time um, helps um, the device that, that's already secured by implementing uh, different security features. Um, the stay secure service uh, helps us to stay secure over products uh, like them. What do we want to protect? Scope of security, of course, is different for every project. Um, I showed you those different uh, layers uh, in security, and um, we may care about uh, um, network security, um, but a device that only allows access, um, direct access to a device may not care about network security. Uh, <clears throat> The software identity verification is a baseline building block of security. Um, first, we have to know that the software that runs uh, on a device really comes from us, that no one else has um, um, uploaded any of the software to, uh, the, to the device, to the hard drive partition or to an SD card partition and um, simply run it. Uh, we can verify um, entire system or just a part of it, um, a file system partition application. Uh, <clears throat> and then we can keep on asking additional questions. Past the software identification or verification of identity, uh, do we care about um, uh, keeping it confidential? Um, how do we plan to uh, deploy and maintain a software on a device is also a, a, a good question because those um, requirements play um, a key factor in a design process. <clears throat> At TAMSYS, we always say that uh, if uh, security is important, um, you should be always identifying security requirements early on. Um, why? Because um, this um, security uh, implementation or features that have to be uh, taken into account um, can and typically do change the software design. So uh, if we would, if we were to bolt the security uh, as an add-on to a device, so if we have a ready-made product and we want to bolt security on top of it, um, that may require um, a bit more of engineering effort and engineering time from our team. All right. So if we have an option to um, or chance to uh, design security early on, we should always do that. <clears throat> okay, so at this point I'm going to um, switch to a signing images topic and um, this section, the next uh, I would say 10 slide or so, uh, can be a little bit technical. Um, so please uh, stay with us, stay with me here on those slides. I'll, I'll do my best in describing um, what the Secure Boot really does. But before we um, uh, navigate through these slides, a uh, few um, slides on terminology. So hash, it's simply a, a way to uh, represent certain information through a hash function and uh, receive a hash sum in the end. This approach is used uh, in public key cryptography <clears throat> where you would generate a public and private key. Um, and um, in this approach, um, we have here Alice and Bob. There's an information that Alice wants to send to Bob. Um, and um, first, we want to make sure that uh, the information really comes from Alice, right? So Alice uses the private key to uh, sign the message that she wants to send to Bob. And then she sends the message. Bob simply uh, uses um, Alice's public key um, to verify that the message really came from Alice. And um, 
uh, that's also the um, mechanism that uh, secure boot is using so this is in the simplistic simplistic terms um, how the um, keys operate on software verification then we have uh, several uh, terms that I wanted to introduce. There's a command sequence file that you're going to see in the uh, next couple of slides, which includes data signature, public key certificates, and image-specific information. There is a code signing tool, uh, different utilities provided by NXP uh, to sign, to help with signing and encryption of software. HUB stands for High Assurance Boot, which is um, secure boot uh, from NXP. <clears throat> There's a hub library, uh, which is software that's embedded in ROM to uh, help us authenticate software. There is image vector table, which represents a data structure that ROM reads, uh, which provides information on a program image, such as um, uh, image entry point to uh, perform a successful boot. And then we have a super root key, which is part of the public key infrastructure um, they are hashed and stored in um, IMAX 6s fuses. So we're going to talk about fuses a bit more in the next few steps. So uh, when we do say secure boot without encryption, uh, we should um, expect authentication and integrity. Um, the, uh, the, the signing approach alone does not provide anti-cloning. Uh, it uses the um, private key to um, sign the image and a public key to verify the uh, image. And um, uh, the bootloader verification um, is performed by ROM code. It, it doesn't have to be only the bootloader, it can also be a Linux kernel, but that's done through the ROM code. So um, how does the flow look like? On a host PC, we compute the hash and then we sign it with a private key. Uh, we uh, receive the signature, which we attach to a bootloader. We take the bootloader with a signature and we deploy it into a device. Um, now, on the target device, bootrom um, simply reads the bootloader, uh, computes its hash, and then reads the signature, uses the public key to verify um, the uh, the hash and then compares the verified hash and computed hash. If it's a match, then that means that the image is authentic and image can boot on the device. If it's not, uh, well, then um, if the configuration, um, hub configuration is closed, then um, the device will basically stop. and um, you will have to reboot and provide um, appropriate image with correct signature for the device to work. Okay. So what is the process of implementing HAB on IMX6, on Advantec IMX6? Step one, we have to create public private key pairs. Uh, step two, we have to flash those keys into the pro programmable fuses. Those are one-time programmable fuses. If you flash, a value to those fuses, you cannot flash anything else. Um, once the configuration is closed, um, you can't uh, change any of um, that information. In the next step, we have to uh, configure um, the first software that runs on a device, uh, configure it with options that um, allow us to uh, authenticate the next software level. So we we have to configure hub functionality into U-Boot and compile U-Boot. Then we uh, sign U-Boot image with keys generated in step one. And we can do the same thing for Linux kernel. Okay, So for the Linux kernel image, we can use the same generated keys and um, uh, tools provided by NXP to create signed Linux kernel image. The bootloader and Linux kernel are then deployed and um, ROM uh, together with hub library does the thing. So uh, what is the thing that it does? Well, actually two more slides before we talk about this. Um, so in this approach, we're going to have a uh, ROM um, API that's going to check the uh, signature on the U-boot uh, image 
and then um, that similar information can be used to verify signature on the Linux kernel. Now, uh, some of the drawbacks of this approach is that this is SOC uh, specific code. So uh, if you learn this um, on IMX6, um, well, this is IMX6 specific. Uh, please do not expect that exact same process is gonna work on something else, okay? But the same process works uh, across um, IMX6 different platforms that NXP uh, makes. So if you stay within that plat platform family, um, the same process will apply. Okay, so uh, Hardware Assurance Boot. Um, the HAP library is responsible for verifying the digital signatures included as part of the product software and ensures that when the processor is configured as a secure device, so the, um, no other modifications are uh, allowed to one-time programmable uh, fuses, etc. cetera, no un 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 authenticated code is allowed to run. So that's, that's important. Uh, <clears throat> The um, uh, first IMX uh, boot ROM reads the eFuses um, to determine the security configuration of the um, processor and the type of the boot device. Um, the ROM then um, continues to load the bootloader image to uh, RAM memory. Um, the image contains both the bootloader logic itself, uh, but also digital signature data and public key certificate, um, which uh, is marked here as this um, CSF file, command sequence file. Once the bootloader is loaded, um, execution is then passed to hub library, which verifies the signature of the bootloader stage. If the signature verification fails, execution is not allowed. Um, if the um, execution, I'm sorry, if the verification is um, uh, correct, then of course the um, U-boot in this case uh, continues to boot. And then bootloader itself can um, apply the similar process to a Linux kernel. Okay, so let's uh, navigate through the process of uh, securing uh, the device. Um, first step is to generate the keys. Uh, you have to download code signing tools from NXP. Um, and within uh, the keys directory, uh, you have to modify the serial and key pass um, files. So uh, here there is a, simply a string um, of numbers um, that's used for um, uh, by OpenSSL. And then we have um, a passphrase that protects the HAP signing, um, uh, HAP code signing private keys. And uh, this is simply a string that's repeated twice in a key pass.txt file. Once these are introduced, we can proceed to generate the keys. Um, there is a script provided uh, in the code signing tools keys subfolder called HAP4 PKI tree. And uh, you just can follow the default um, responses uh, that will generate uh, four kilobyte um, long keys that last for 10 years with four super root keys. Uh, the private keys are placed in a keys directory uh, of this code signing tool uh, and the corresponding public keys are stored on the search directory. Uh, it's important because we have to always protect the private keys. If the private keys leave our premises, if they are not protected well, uh, the device well is compromised as well. In the next step, um, we can uh, generate the, um, a table of public SRKs and uh, another file, um, which is a fuse um, table. It's this uh, fuse.bin file here which is going to contain all the values that have to be stored in one-time programmable fuses on IMX6. Okay, so this command here, using the ASR SRK tool, um, generates those values for us based on the uh, serial and the passphrase that we've entered uh, previously. <clears throat> so to uh, flash the keys, 
uh, there's this fuse.bin file that contains different values. And I've used the hex dump uh, utility, um, which is available on the Linux PC, to read um, the file, to read this uh, fuse.bin file. And um, in the output, you will get eight values like this, formatted like this. Okay, Those are the actual values that you want to burn into the fuses. Uh, fuses are... Uh, IMX uh, 6 specific, um, bank 3 registers 0 through 7 are uh, used to store the uh, keys values, bank 0 register 6 is used to um, uh, close the configuration. Okay, so um, uh, there is a uh, uboot fuse command with which I can program these values directly into one-time programmable fuses. Do not, please do not um, write the value to bank zero register six to close the configuration unless you are 100% sure that um, those are the correct keys for production. Okay. Once you uh, uh, flash the wrong keys, there is no way back. Uh, <clears throat> now, I wanted to show you also the uh, image layout for Secure Boot. Um, so we have the U-Boot image, we have device configuration data and boot data that contains destination, image size, and plugin uh, flag. So all that information can be and typically is attached to U-Boot um, image with uh, make image, which is a utility that comes with U-Boot itself. But on top of that, I have the image vector table, which contains this command sequence file. The command sequence file has a direct link to uh, the signatures, to certificates. Um, all that information, the IVT boot data, device configuration data, and U-boot are signed. And that signature is then appended uh, to the U-boot image. Okay, so let me show you how this is done. Um, first, you configure U-boot to um, have uh, support for IMX uh, hub features. Um, so this is right here. And then using the make image, um, as you can see in the picture down below, um, we are attaching this additional information um, to the U-boot uh, image binary. Um, and that also will give us information on hub blocks. That information is used in a following step to um, um, generate a correct command sequence file because as you remember the previous picture um, the IVT table has a direct pointer to a uh, um, signature. So uh, <clears throat> how do I sign U-Boot? Now that I have a binary I copy the IMX image to a CST directories um, and I, uh, I can download a, a U-Boot um, CSF file. There are lots of uh, those files on the on the network that you can find, and you have to populate that CSF file with appropriate information, such as hub blocks, uh, numbers, entries have to be um, correctly specified in this CSF file. And then, using the code signing tools, using this uh, CST command, I uh, generate a signature, a signature that's going to uh, be stored in this U-boot underscore csf dot bin. So this is a signature that's using the private keys um, from the code signing tools. And in the end, I combine using simply cat command the U-boot binary with the um, signature. Okay, so that generates the signed bootloader image. Okay. Um, in the last step, I deploy the U-boot image to the um, device, and um, I can verify the authenticity by um, just uh, running hub status command, and you can see that no hub events found, which means that um, the signature uh, matches the, um, the public keys that are flashed in one-time programmable fuses. Okay. So signature is valid. Okay, for the Linux kernel, real quick, um, Renault, uh, Linux kernel um, has a, a similar structure. Uh, you signed a Z image that's padded to the nearest four kilobytes. Um, and um, you can use U-Boot itself to uh, verify the signature on the Linux kernel. So once U-Boot is up and running, 
I can use the U-Boot functionality. Now U-Boot is aware of Hub, has the Hub features uh, built in. So I can use those features, those utilities that U-Boot comes with to verify that the next image, the Z image um, signature is correct. Okay. So uh, signing of the Linux kernel is similar to si signing of uh, a U-Boot. Um, instead of a command sequence file, there is a gen IVT file that you can find on a network. Um, you have to find the Z image, which represents the Linux kernel um, size, round it to the nearest four kilobytes. And then inside the gen IVT script, um, you simply specify appropriate values. So uh, the load address, the load address plus IVT offset, um, see a, uh, code sequence file pointer, all that information can be um, calculated based on the Z image uh, size and the load address. Okay. Now, these steps um, are very well explained in various documents that NXP provides. So uh, this presentation is uh, here to sh just show you how um, to navigate through this process. But uh, if you plan to implement this, um, there are more detailed manuals. Plus, uh, Times' trust team can assist with um, securing uh, your um, device uh, with Secure Boot. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, we uh, we've generated here a, a signature for the Linux kernel. We are appending the signature called IVT.bin to um, padded Z image, and that generates the um, Z image pad IVT bin file, which is a signed Linux kernel image. Okay, So I want to show you um, in the next um, uh, slide, or actually a demo, um, how this works. So um, if everything works, um, I should see no HAP events found, um, which means that the signature uh, is verified as valid. So let me show you uh, real quick a uh, a video here um, starting the system um, and you can see that it starts and there's no HAP events found, which means that the signature on the Linux kernel is correct. Um, the system boots as expected. And um, uh, this is uh, um, the DMS BA16 Advantech IMX6 board. And now what I'm doing is I'm copying the Z image unsigned into uh, the place of the Z image. So I'm swapping the image um, and then rebooting. Uh, when a system reboots, um, you can see, uh, it will take just a moment. Uh, you can see that here, uh, HAP event one, events start to pop up, which means that unsigned image was uh, caught and the system says, oh, fault, this, this image is not signed properly, therefore I'm not allowing it to run. And the system is programmed in such a way that it goes back to a factory image, loads the signed factory image that's verified, and then um, comes back with um, uh, full functionality that we were expecting. Okay, so this is uh, how, um, Hub really helps us with uh, making sure that the software that runs on a device really comes from us, from our company. Now, we've discussed securing um, by signing the first software level that runs on a device and second software level that runs on a device. So uh, U boot bootloader and then the Linux kernel. But um, <clears throat> the whole software stack needs to be authenticated and validated, not just uh, the U-boot bootloader or a um, Linux kernel. If we care about the verifying the authenticity of our application, and oftentimes when we update software in a field, we uh, want to just update uh, an application or perhaps a package inside the file system, we want to extend 
that chain of trust uh, from um, the ROM and the bootloader and the Linux kernel all the way up to a root file system. Um, we want to use the uh, chain of trust to also secure communication and um, verify that the application, the end application that runs on a device, if it's a point of sales or medical device, that that application is really the one that was written by our company. So how do we do that? Um, one approach to extending um, the uh, chain of trust to file system is to use so-called flattened image tree, which um, allows us to generate a single file that contains um, Linux kernel um, device tree blob, which represents the um, uh, device driver's um, initialization data, and then a file system in the form of RAM file system. Okay, so these three files can be combined into a single executable, and then I can uh, generate a signature for just one FIT file, and I can verify that signature with Uboot. Now, advantages of this approach are that um, this is functionality mainline to Uboot. It's integrated in Yocto. Um, it has very low impact on boot time. Now, the disadvantages are that it's limited to RAMFS. Um, so read only, well, it's, it's uh, not only, it's not read only, it's, um, uh, you can, um, it's not persistent. Maybe that's, that's a better uh, way of describing it. Now, how do I create a fit file? Um, there is a um, configuration file, uh, a .its, which uses semantics similar to the device tree. Uh, where each node represents um, a separate image that goes into a fit file. Okay, so we have here one node for the Linux kernel, one node for uh, flattened device tree, and one node for RAM disk. And then the configurations down below ties all these nodes together, um, showing that, um, well, uh, each of these each of these uh, software components uh, will be using a uh, SHA-1 uh, and will be merged into a single image. So uh, <clears throat> how do we generate a fit image? We use the make image, which is utility that um, comes with um, U-Boot. And um, as an input, uh, I pass the ITS, the configuration of the fit image, and the different images that uh, are gonna be combined together. So I'm getting the fit image, which then I'm signing using also the make image and RSA uh, key pair. So that way I, I'm gonna get a signed fit image um, that I can deploy onto a device. Now that's um, limiting because uh, I cannot use um, a hard drive um, file system or, uh, well, SD card file system. So one other option is um, VM Verity, which is commonly used in Android and Chrome OS. It operates at the block level uh, below the file system layer. Um, and for every block at each layer, there is a hash um, that's uh, being computed. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, the hash of a layer below is verified by a hash of a la layer above. Um, so only the root hash needs to be uh, verified. And um, the, the signing key can be stored inside uh, this uh, RAMFS in a fit file, right? So in a fit image. So it can be a staged booting where I use the fit image to um, mount the initial file system as RAM file system. That's where I'm going to have the uh, verification key for um, the larger root file system that I mount from a hard drive. And um, that's how this VM Verity can be used. <clears throat> okay. Uh, implementing DM Verity is uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, it's available in the Linux kernel. Um, so you enable the DM Verity functionality. Uh, you create a root file system image. You then generate the tree of um, the hashes 
for the image. There are tools that uh, DM Verity provides for that. Um, then you build and sign the DM Verity table, um, add the metadata and concatenate um, the to the system image. So these steps are automated for Android for um, standard Linux uh, require a more manual uh, process. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna um, navigate to this slide. Um, TAMS's security offering uh, we've discussed last time um, were around staying secure service. Um, today we have focused on um, uh, high assurance boot. So staying secure part um, by implementing um, signature verification using the hardware IMX6 specific features. So the takeaways from uh, the session today, uh, signing images is uh, very fundamental to verifying software authenticity. Um, hardware support is helpful. Um, it allows us to um, ensure key security and uh, allows us to verify the signatures by um, having the hub library inside the ROM. Uh, <clears throat> to uh, secure the entire product software stack, uh, and we're still talking only about uh, signatures, about identity of the software, uh, we need to implement chain of trust that starts at the uh, ROM um, and then goes through a first software layer, which is bootloader, Linux kernel, file system, application. <clears throat> so um, each uh, verified software can be used to ver verify another layer. Uh, now, building security into a product requires design modifications. So uh, this is where we recommend that you identify those security requirements early on in the project because that will allow you to save many cycles. Um, it is very easy to leverage hardware security features uh, when working with Advantex risk platforms. Um, all of these uh, platforms that we've discussed um, are capable of supporting a uh, hub, so secure boot. Um, <clears throat> now, sometimes uh, it's um, uh, needed. Uh, I mean, um, the trusted platform modules, I didn't talk about this much, um, but this is uh, another approach for um, extending um, storage for security information. So uh, it would it can be added to um, IMX6 processor um, and can store additional certificates, keys that can be used to verify um, multiple different um, uh, software components with different keys. Uh, <clears throat> so trusted platform modules topic is going to come up in one of our next sessions, but um, I wanted to mention it here as well because it is somewhat similar to what um, Hub and Secure Boot is doing. Um, trusted platforms can help with uh, secure boot um, in certain implementations and can extend that functionality. Um, please remember that TAMS's trust team uh, of uh, our security experts is available to work with you on identifying um, and implementing security requirements uh, in your products. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop here and let's open the floor for questions. Thank you much, hey, and thank you, Jason, for another great session. Um, you've provided a, our audience with a lot of very helpful and very technical information on how they can protect their embedded Linux device against un unauthorized access. Uh, we did get uh, a couple or a few really good questions, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll walk you through those questions now. Um, this one is for Mache. Uh, where is it possible to download the CST utility? Uh, the uh, okay, the code signing tools. Okay, yep. So this is a set of tools provided by NXP. You uh, you would need to have an account uh, with NXP. Uh, if if you design with IMX6, uh, most likely you will have um, 
the account already. So using that account, you log in um, and um, you will find very easily by searching the code signing tools on, on NXP's uh, servers. Great, thanks. And I keep forgetting I have myself on mute, so I apologize. <laughs> Um, this question, we'll go ahead and um, we'll, we'll uh, pose this one for Akshay. Um, is there enough room in the one-time programmable fuses to store multiple keys so that you could rotate to a secondary public key if someone did actually get a hold of the first private key, say, as you do firmware updates over the product lifetime? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, so when Mathe was going over the slides, he mentioned about the SRK table. So the SRK table is a hash of the public keys of, um, which are generated using the CST tools. Um, and you can set it up to generate up to four keys and correspondingly burn the hash of the four public keys onto the device and through field upgrades you can revoke up to three of these keys using a separate fuse bit available on the imx processor um, as and when your private key gets compromised so you're allowed up to like uh, three compromises during the product's lifetime perfect thank you for that um, next question we received is, do I need to pay for the hub feature? So the hub functionality is integral, integral to um, the IMX6 processor, uh, and it comes with the purchase of the processor. There's no separate fee for hub. Okay, good answer, good answer, good information. Next question, um, how do I integrate this into the development release process? So I'll let Akshay to uh, maybe take um, okay, we'll a stab at this Akshay. one. Um, so typically customers go with two different approaches. One is like having a dedicated signing server um, or the other approach is to integrate all of this into your build system, like say Yocto, um, and let the build system perform the signing. Uh, the choice depends on uh, who has access to the build system versus who has access to the signing server. Um, and if you're going to integrate it into the build system itself, um, depending on which version of Yocto you're running, uh, there may or may not be support available, uh, out of the box support available. For example, like fit image signing is available starting with Yocto 2.2. Uh, whereas if you're trying to integrate the code signing tools, since the download of the tool itself is uh, uh, it's a proprietary tool, uh, you might need to do, you might have to add your own recipe to do the signing aspect. Um, and um, if you have any questions, you can always contact Timesys and we can help with the integration as well. Great, thank you, Akshay. And let's see, uh, another question here. How can Timesys assist with HOB? Maciej, is that something that you want to take? Sure, absolutely. So uh, Timesys has a dedicated team of security specialists. Um, that uh, can uh, work with um, customers' requirements um, and look at individual and specific needs of the product. Um, if there is, for example, a uh, field uh, upgrades, um, over-the-air upgrades um, capability that's uh, also needed, that plays a, a role into uh, the design. So um, our trust team would work directly with the customer uh, identifying all the requirements and then would assist with um, design document and then implementation of uh, security features. Um, and this is done through uh, 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 engagement between the engineering teams um, and this is under services. 
Great, Actually, thank do you, you. want to add anything to this? Because actually you are part of the trust team. Um, I'm not sure if uh, there is any other aspect that I've missed. Um, but um, I think you covered it pretty well. Okay, great. Great. Um, let's see, there's another good question here. What are the implications on a device after the keys of the certificates expire? Um, I can take that. So okay. on, on the IMX platform, there are no implications. The reason being like um, for the validity um, of the certificate to be verified, you need like a real time clock. Um, to be implemented. So, um, and since this is product specific, um, the IMXX processor itself is like kept it generic and they do not verify the validity of like the certificate used for the bootloader. However, if you're, if we take a higher level layer, like uh, verifying the certificate used for, let's say like a fit image or um, for the RFS, then in, in that case, um, you could implement uh, certificate checks such that like uh, it's within a valid um, time period. Okay, great. Thank you for that answer. Um, let's see, I think there's one more question here. Um, please, if you have any additional questions, go ahead and submit them now. Um, one question that did come in, and I will pose this question, I will answer this question also. Um, can you please provide the slides after the webinar is over? Um, yes, for those of you who joined us after the webinar was already in session, uh, you will receive, um, within 24 hours, you'll receive an email that will contain a link to the recording, as well as a link to download the actual slides. And I believe that's everything. I don't see any additional questions here. So, um, Mache, Akshay, is there anything uh, additional that you'd like to add? I just wanted to uh, uh, mention again, there's a drawing of uh, uh, a price, a takeaway uh, again this week. So, uh, good luck, everyone. And I hope that uh, you will join us again for session three. Thanks, Mache. And uh, so, on behalf of Mache, Jason, Akshay, and myself, I want to thank you all again for being online with us today. We'll see you again, as Mache mentioned. We hope to see you again in two weeks for session three, which is leveraging open source software to protect IP and data on the device. So thanks again, everyone, and have a good day.